It is so good to be with each and every single one of you. I'm coming off a fantastic week for Hensel Nation. We got to do a little mini getaway uh, vacation for a couple of days. And then Jennifer and I uh, got to be able to hang out with all of our staff and some key uh, part-timers and difference makers from all across our locations for a two-day all-staff retreat. On the heels of that, I had to go pick up my boys from my parents' house. And on the way home, you know, they're debriefing, and apparently to pass time, my mom was telling stories to my kids about me growing up. And my, uh, you guys know this, I need some context first. Um, my dad was a veterinarian. Uh, he did large and small animal. He's very hands-on father, took me to hang out with uh, him on a lot of his business. And all of a sudden in the, uh, the car, uh, my boys start telling uh, uh, the story to me of my first day at kindergarten. And uh, this is what my mom decided to tell my boys, which was, you know, lack of judgment on her part. Um, when my mom picked me up from school on my first day of kindergarten, she goes, how was it today? And I said, I didn't know my one, two, threes. And I didn't know my ABCs. But they didn't know anything about the uterus of a cow. <laughs> and so I'm... I've, that's what my boys are like, just laughing, and I'm like, I, do I have to explain uterus now? Like, I don't know, I don't know what we do here. Now, why am I telling you that story? Well, I have no clue what your last week was like. I don't know what kind of baggage you're navigating, what kind of hurt or harm you're trying to work your way through. I don't know any of that. But what I do know is you picked a great place to be today. That any time you gather with the people of the Lord in the house of the Lord, expose yourself to the word of the Lord, by the spirit of the Lord, you will be blessed. If you are brand new to the crossing, we are so glad that you're here. I hope that at some point in time during the service, you'll either click on the QR code or maybe at the very end of the service, you'll go and meet one of our campus pastors, staff members, incredible difference makers, and get connected at one of our uh, connecting booths in one of our lobbies. And you have no idea what God could do with just that one small act of faith. We are in week three of a sermon series called Weeds in My Garden, a series about being honest about mental health. And week one, we learned that in order to live out the second greatest commandment we, uh, given to us by Jesus, we need to destigmatize issues surrounding mental health. Uh, right behind, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength is the command to love your neighbor as yourself. And when we fail to love people well, it impacts our relationship with God, our relationship with them, their relationship with others, and if we're Christians, it can impact their relationship with God. Now, uh, it impacts their relation, or our relationship with God because we end up treating people poorly uh, the very people poorly that Jesus died to save and commanded us to serve. It impacts our relationship with them because they're not going to feel comfortable uh, being honest with us and they'll push away. They'll start just giving us roses so we don't see the weeds in their garden. And as they pull away from us, it will be harder for us to offer the help and the hope that they may desperately need. And the further they pull away, the less bright our light will shine. This creates even more isolation and can leave them destitute and vulnerable. It can impact their relationship with God because they will judge God by our actions. It's not right. It's not fair. But it's real. If you and I are to be the very hands and feet of Jesus, the expression of God to a hurting world, and we handle that glorious mission poorly, it changes how they see God. This culminates in them having a hard time being in relationship with others because if Christians can't be trusted, if God can't be trusted, then who can? And they retreat further into themselves. As loneliness sets in, the isolation leaves them vulnerable. And one of the areas where we have Christians have struggled is being too narrow-minded when it comes to mental health issues. Now, when I say mental health issues, I'm trying to use broad strokes. 
okay? And one of my prayers during this sermon series is that you guys would have grace-filled ears as Jerry and I talk through this stuff because, you know, some people could, could uh, take an unflattering approach to certain things we say or don't say. And so when I say mental health issues, I'm also including in that strong and powerful emotions that are difficult to navigate and control. So there might be some of you who are dealing with depression, but you wouldn't go, I'm, you know, I don't have mental health issues. Or some of you might be dealing with strong uh, and powerful feelings of sadness, but you wouldn't necessarily see them. I'm just using broad strokes. So when I say mental health issues, I'm talking broad, broad strokes. And mental health issues are composed of four main categories or large buckets, if you will. There is a situational, biological, or clinical, and spiritual. Situational might be the loss of a loved one or experiencing a season of high change and high stress. A subcategory to that might be um, behavioral, that you have a hard time navigating or regulating how much time you spend on social media or not uh, making the time to invest in deep and meaningful relationships. Biological is how you are hardwired. Some of us have kidney issues, some of us have insulin issues, some of us are allergic to bees, and some of us have chemical malfunctions. And then clinical issues are the things that need to be addressed professionally. Uh, It could be areas that need to be examined, sifted, diagnosed, treated, prescribed. This could relate to situational trauma of the past, chemical malfunctions of the present, but we need an outside doctor to help us work our way through it. And then the final bucket is the spiritual bucket. And this relates to issues of faith and sin and how we as Christians navigate mental illnesses or as Christians trying to live with those navigating mental illnesses, a narrow-minded approach is going to limit our ability to access the help and the hope that people desperately need. Now, I want you to hear me carefully because I feel like I didn't do as good of a job in week one setting this up. So let me say this. Everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. There is not an area of your life that does not have spiritual meaning, purpose, or consequences. However, not everything in your life is exclusively spiritual. Does that make sense? Everything in your life is spiritual, but not every area of your life is exclusively spiritual. And out of these buckets, there is this huge filter. And on the other side of that filter is how we feel, how we operate, and how we live. Why does this matter? Well, last week, Jerry talked about how we have an enemy, a very real enemy who opposes us in all four of these buckets, and then he attacks the filter that determines how you and I are going to ultimately behave. He attacks you spiritually by getting you to ignore biblical truths or to believe things to be true that are not biblical. For instance, you might be thinking that you're too messed up for God to love you, or you might think that you have to get your life together first before God will accept you. He attacks you in the situational bucket by getting you trapped in sinful patterns or pushing people around you to sin against you. He gets you to think that perhaps financial provision is more important, is the most important thing you can give your kids when what they really need is your presence and spiritual encouragement and engagement. He can attack you biologically and clinically by getting you to avoid seeking uh, help or counseling or perhaps convincing the people that you rely on to downplay your battle. Look at what happens in John chapter eight. Jerry mentioned this last week. Uh, Jesus is talking to a bunch of religious leaders. This is Jesus talking. He says, "You, uh, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He, meaning Satan, was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth In him, when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan, every time he speaks, is lying to us. Every time he speaks, he is trying to pull you from the truth. Uh, Jerry mentioned Jim Putman last week. Jim Putman describes Satan as the lawnmower. 
um, there was a time when I had a, a, a push mower. How many of you guys have ever had a push mower? Yeah, I had one. Then I was like, I don't want to be that skinny. And so I got a riding lawn mower. <laughs> and you know how you have, to, you have to pull start one of those? And this is how Satan kind of comes alongside of us. Is Satan comes up and he starts pulling uh, the mower. And he'll, he'll start saying, uh, you're worthless. You're worthless. You're worthless. And then what happens is, is we take over. So it goes from, and notice the difference, you're worthless. You're worthless too. I'm worthless. I'm worthless. And then we start the mower, and then it mows up everything, every relationship, every financial decision in our life. It just mows it all down. Satan just has to get you started believing the lie, and we will mow down all the rest. Last week, Jerry talked about the very first lie that Satan tells us. He tells us that we are meaningless and that we are worthless. Because of the battles we face, the feelings we feel, that our value, meaning, and significance have been reduced, diminished, or worse yet, for some of us, we think it's been extinguished, past tense. The truth is, though, that God made you. He made you in a significant and personal way, and he knows you. This week, I want to talk to you about another lie that Satan tells us. It's that we are ruined. This lie shows up in various forms. It could show up in the biological bucket. As you come to grips with the reality that you are just put together differently and that your struggles are going to ruin you. You'll never be able to be the person that God created you to be. You'll never be able to live out your purpose like other people get to live out their purpose. It could show up in the clinical bucket. As you deal with the weight of a diagnosis, the life you were hoping to one day have suddenly slips through your fingers. For others, it shows up in permission slips. Satan gets you to make your diagnosis bigger than your choices and sometimes bigger than your God. Sometimes Satan will show up in this way by getting you to take ownership of your diagnosis. Oh, this is what I mean. Um, If I were to, you know, when you're talking about certain things, you're getting ready in the morning and you turn to your wife and be like, hey, have you seen my wallet? Have you seen my shirt? Have you seen my pants? Yeah, you've been there. What happens is, is he gets you to take ownership of your diagnosis. My anxiety, my depression, my chemical malfunction, my schizophrenia. The problem, though, is, is when we start attaching the word my to it, we don't treat it with the same way we treat our wallet because you would never say that you are your wallet. You would never say, I am my pants. You wouldn't even introduce yourself like that way to people. Yeah, my name's Clayton and I'm my pants. You just wouldn't do it. But you will hear people talk about my anxiety, my depression, and they will see that as their identity. Hear me. Your identity is not your diagnosis. Those are two separate things. You may have a diagnosis, but your diagnosis does not have you. Your value is not determined by your diagnosis. Your worth is not determined by your diagnosis. It could show up in the situational bucket as coming to grips with the weight of your actions. You've done something wrong for so long under the cover of darkness that now it's coming into the light and people are going to look at you differently. They will judge you. The mask is being removed and people are going to finally see you for who you really are. And this is Satan's playground. It's here that he removes all light, all help, all hope. He pushes in. He doubles down, and he gets you to start thinking people would be better off if you're not here. No one will ever allow you to get over this. There is no coming back. For others, it's the result of incredible pain and damage done to you by others. Because others have a low view of you, you eventually begin to have a low view of yourself. You begin to believe the lie, no one could ever love me. I deserve this life. I deserve to be treated this way. Look at how much ground Satan has taken, and I haven't even talked about the spiritual bucket. But you could see the spiritual implications in every single one of the illustrations that I just told you. He begins to tell you that God couldn't love you either. You are too far gone. You are too messed up. Your situation is bigger than God. Your situation is too small to bother God. And then some of you, you know people who are in this category, they start going, 
as they're listening to Satan, I've been going to church my whole life. I've been following God my whole life, and this is how my life is turning out. It must not work. It must not be real anyway. That is the deconstruction movement that you sometimes see happening on social media as people are deconstructing their faith. And the hardest part of what we're talking about here is the very part of our body that is being attacked by Satan is the same part of our body that has to make the decisions about how to move forward. It's like Satan tries to grab a hold of the steering wheel, the gas, and the brake all at the same time. Who cares about whether or not the doors and the wiper fluids work? He's got control of the car. So if these are the lies that Satan is telling us, what are the truths? And if you're here today and you need a little bit of hope and a little bit of help, this is critical to our path forward as Jesus' people. I want to give you five spiritual truths to combat the lie that we are ruined. First one, God is not surprised by your struggles. God is not up in heaven going, what? I did not see that happening. Holy Spirit, you couldn't give me a heads up? He's not afraid of our brokenness. He's not allergic to your pain or your misery. When Jesus came to earth, he came to help and to heal. Read through the Gospels. And you will see over and over again how much time Jesus took to minister to those who were dealing with pain from one of the four buckets. I'll just give you four. He treated a situational issue with the woman caught in adultery. She was set up and oppressed by other people, and he stopped and took note and addressed it. He also helped those who were dealing with mental challenges with the demon-possessed man. And after Jesus is done with them, he's sitting there dressed, and the Bible says, in his right mind. He stepped in the spiritual waters with the man on the mat, which I'm going to talk to you about in just a second. And he dealt with biological issues with the woman with the flow of blood. Look what happens in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. He, this is Jesus, went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath, it was their Saturday, think of it as like church day. And he went into the synagogue, think church. So Jesus got up on technically Saturday, went to church. As was his custom. So if Jesus goes to church, what's your excuse, okay? Um, He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Old Testament, okay? Keep going. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the church were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus goes to church. He opens up the Old Testament. He reads it and goes, you know that thing that you've been waiting for? That time you've been longing for? The arrival upon the, of the one who would heal the broken and bind up the wounded? It's fulfilled. I'm here. This is why I came. Truth number two. God is not surprised by our sin. From a spiritual perspective, God knew that we were ruined. That's why he sent Jesus in the first place. If you've been coming to the crossing for any period of time, uh, you've heard us talk about this verse before, Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I mean, from a spiritual perspective, every single one of us are ruined. But the problem is, is we spend all of our time comparing each other in non-spiritual ways. So, uh, some of you, uh, you know, you make more than others. Some of you have nicer houses than others. Some of you go on better vacations than others. Some of you have nicer clothes than others. Some of you, your clothes fit better than others. But listen, from a spiritual perspective, you're ruined. Your clothes just might fit better. 
You might have more spots for your cars to park in your driveway. But spiritually speaking, we are all destitute. We're ruined. We were done in. There was no hope, but God stepped into that very space. He came to deal with our greatest need, which was sin. Now, I'm going to show you a super cool passage of Scripture. Uh, If you've been a part of the crossing, you've heard this one before. So Jesus uh, was doing his ministry, and there was a group of friends that had a paralyzed friend. And he had been laying on a mat for his whole life. And so four of them picked up their paralyzed man on a mat, and they were taking him to go see Jesus. And when they got to the house where Jesus was, they couldn't get him because the place was packed. And so their solution was, uh, let's just climb up on the roof and and cut a hole in the roof and lower him uh, right in front of Jesus. And, you know, um, well, let's pick up the story. Uh, When Jesus saw their faith, so Jesus, like, looks up, sees four heads poking through the roof. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. What the Jesus, Jesus? He's paralyzed. Jesus, he can't walk. How did you, why did we make a hole in the roof if Jesus was going to forgive his sin? We brought him here because he can't walk. Right? Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, let's keep going for a second. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking. Uh Uh-oh. I mean, everybody thinks they'd like to hang out with Jesus, but are you sure? (laughs) Because, I mean, you've been at church and you know some of the things you've been thinking already. Jesus is not a safe person, okay? Fellas, you wouldn't take Jesus to the bar, okay? Be like, how many of you had? And you'd say your number and you'd be like, no. No, you haven't. You've had four, and the one that you have isn't yours, right? Okay? Why? He says to them, that was catchy. You guys will appreciate that later if you're a Bible nerd. Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk? But what I want you to know is that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Let's keep going. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. A paralyzed man gets dropped in front of Jesus, and Jesus' heart immediately goes to the sin. What's the point in having a man who can walk, walk straight to hell? Jesus sees the paralyzed man, and everybody else can just see the physical, but Jesus sees the greatest need, the spiritual, and he forgives his sins. And then when everybody's like, well, hold on a second, nobody can forgive sins, Jesus is like, oh, you want to know what kind of power I have? Well, just so you know that his sins are forgiven, I'm going to show you by telling this man to get up and walk, and the man got up and walked. Not only did he get physical healing that day, he got spiritual healing that day. This was Jesus' mission to take care of our biggest need. Look at Mark chapter 2, verse 17, later in the same chapter. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. In other words, if you are here today, watching online, part of the crossing inside, and you're not righteous. You've got some spiritual bumps and bruises. I want you to hear me say this. Jesus came for you. That's why he came. And there is nothing too big for him. He came on purpose to save you from this ruined state. Truth number three, nothing is too small for God. Satan would have you believe that God's only good for the big things. Don't bother him. He's incredibly busy. Just call him when things get really out of hand. In light of all the problems in the world and in light of all the challenges that are happening at different continents and all the geopolitical issues, you really shouldn't bother Jesus with the little things in your life. You've heard me tell this story before. 
I can't run a bead of caulk to save my life. Can't do it. I've bought the little infomercial stuff where you put the little spatula on your finger, and I've done all the, and I am horrible. I start, and then um, what happens is after I do it, I punch a hole in my shower. And, it, and I say that because it's happened twice, two different homes. And uh, I fixed the one at, our, at the Macomb house, um, but the one in our house now is not fixed because I'm not ready to fix update my bathroom yet, so there's just pink duct tape in a, in a cross pattern that reminds me that Jesus paid for that. And <laughs> when I took a shower today, I stared at a pink cross that is covering a hole. And the reason why is, is even though I'm only trying to run that bead of caulk for like 24 inches, I think to myself, I cannot call in a favor. I'm a man. I got this. This will not be a problem. And then what happens is, is I start it, I get frustrated, and then sometime after that, there's a hole in the wall, and then I go get the duct tape. And then I've taken a very small problem, and I've turned it into an embarrassing problem. And then I'll finally call somebody who's a professional, and I'll say, hey, man, I need you to come over and do this. And then their stupid butt shows up. All right, man, should be good. <laughs> You just, oh, you, you, okay. I wouldn't have pink duct tape in if I would just call the professional. So, yeah, I know this is, this is going to seem like nothing, but it's a lot to me. And we have this mentality when it comes to Jesus that our problems have to be gigantic and significant. If only you would call a professional. God, I know you have a lot going on, but, well, look at this. Luke chapter 12. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. When you pray, you are praying to a God who knows just how much of you you left behind in the shower today, ladies. He knows. He knows that there is a rat nest of your hair in the drain, and he can tell you just how much is there. Some of you older fellas, you took a shower today and nothing changed, okay? It's just, you use body wash head to toe now, okay? And he knows. And a God who keeps track of the hairs on your head knows exactly what you're going through. It means you can cry out to him, God, I'm having a hard time getting out of bed today, and I need you to help me. Uh, other small prayers. God, I have a hard time being on social media too much. Would you give me the strength to just leave my phone face down a little bit longer today? God, I don't have the energy to get up and do some of the things that my family needs, but could you just give me a little breath of fresh air for, for just 20 minutes? You can go to God in the small things. The problem is we don't go to God with the small things, and the small things start piling up until they become big things which isn't a problem for God, but it is a problem for us and all the people we love because it makes the path back on earth so much harder than it had to be. That's why we work so hard to get the love and ethics of Jesus into our kids at a very young age so they don't have to start living for Jesus after they have created so much negative inertia here on earth. Truth number four, God has the power to restore that which is broken and ruined. And he does this in one of two ways. The first way that he does it is sometimes he does it in the here and now. For his purposes, for his glory, to demonstrate his healing power, I know people who have been healed of issues of depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. Some of you may know people like that too. And it is a beautiful and wonderful thing to behold. And when we do, we're like, oh my goodness, isn't God good? And sometimes God chooses to bring about the healing and restoration upon his second coming when he makes all things new. And I know that some of you who are listening to me right now went, not cool, man. You're frustrated by that statement. Because if you were being honest, who wants one day healing? Someday healing. I think every single one of us would choose, I want the now healing, Jesus. If I have a choice, 
between today and someday, I'm choosing today. But if I can be honest with you, someday healing is the one that I love the most. It's the people who turn their struggle into a story. It's the people who turn their tragedy into a testimony. While other people may have a shallow understanding of of living in the strength of God, these people have a deep understanding of dependence. That even in my worry, I will trust. Even in my anxiety, I will choose to follow. Even in my depression, I will give him glory. Even in my pain, I will still praise And God uses these faithful stories to create faith in others. And the problem is it never happens unless we are honest about not being honest. And it never happens until we start telling the people around us what we're actually going through. And we keep the story to ourselves and we keep our struggles hidden. And everyone else around us thinks that they're the only one when in reality they are surrounded by people who are in the same boat. My favorite story Oh, I hope this ministers to your heart. My favorite story of this is the Apostle Paul. If you read in the book of Acts, Paul was healing people. He had the ability to heal those who were afflicted. In fact, his healing was so fantastic that if he he would take a handkerchief and he would touch it, And then they would take that handkerchief and they would pass it through other places and anybody who touched the handkerchief would be healed. But you read in 2 Corinthians and Paul cries out about a thorn in the flesh. He says, and three times I cried unto the Lord. And God said, one day. What? What? Come on, Jesus. You mean I can heal other people? I can be used to bring healing in other people? Can I touch my own handkerchief? How come the thing I touch is good for everybody else, but it doesn't work on me? Jesus says one day. And Paul didn't use that to stop declaring the faithfulness of God. He continued to fulfill his calling. He pushed through the pain that he wasn't going to get the today healing, even though God was going to use him to bring today healing to others. If we're going to be a church that's being honest about being honest, if we're going to be a church that loves people for the weeds in their gardens, if we're going to be a church that wants to offer a little bit of help and a little bit of hope, we're going to have to cling to those truths. We're moving to a time of decision. Now, some of you, your teachers, you're getting ready to go back in the classroom and you're like, Clayton, you said five truths. And that was four. And I took notes and now I've got this spot on my page and what am I going to do with it? Fifth truth. It's never too late. It is never too late to turn things over to God. It is never too late to seek him. No matter how bad the situation is, no matter how bad the diagnosis is, no matter how much the pain is, no matter how much the frustration is, no matter how many small uh, decisions, bad decisions you've made that have turned into a big decision, it is never too late to approach your heavenly father. Sunday night, 10.30 at night, I'm working on this sermon, and I saw something. Now, those of you who've been growing up in church your whole life, you're going to be like, Clayton, how did you not see this? I mean, I, I've, I've seen it. I knew it. I just, I just didn't put it together the way I did at 10.30 on, on Sunday night. And I could not wait for this moment with you. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 44, you can go home and check this out. This is what it says. In the same way, the rebels, or criminals, who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. So you get this picture. There's Jesus in the middle being crucified, and one on his right and one on his left are heaping insults at him. That's Matthew chapter 27. If you go to Mark chapter 15, verse 32, go home, check it out. This is what it says. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. 
Here's the picture. One on his right, one on his left, are heaping insults on Jesus. And some of you are going, hold on a second, Clayton. There's a story inside of this. I know this story. Yeah, the story you know is from Luke's gospel. Listen to what it says. Starting in verse 39 in chapter 23. Remember 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Did you see it? It starts off with Jesus in the middle with a thief on his right and a thief on his left. And both of them are hurling insults. And it ends with one of them going, I don't know. Would you, what caused the change? How did he go from hurling insults at Jesus to defending Jesus and shooting his shot? I said, remember verse 39. I want you to go back seven verses in Luke's gospel. This is what he says in verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were led out to be with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Do you see it? A criminal's hurling insults at Jesus, and Jesus is hearing the insults from the criminals He's looking at the people who shouted, crucify him, crucify him. He's looking at the people who shouted, Barabbas. He's looking at the people who are nailing him. He's looking at the people who mocked him. And Jesus on the cross cries out to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And the criminal goes, hold on a second here. Do you think that forgiveness could be for me too? And so he says, Jesus, do you remember me? And Jesus says, today you will be with me. Can you imagine this guy showing up in heaven? Hey, what are you doing here? Weren't you the guy next to Jesus? Yeah. Weren't you the one throwing insults at him? Yeah. Did you go to church regularly? No. Never. Did you ever take communion? Not once. What are we talking about here? Did you serve in a ministry? Nope. Did you clean up after yourself when you went to the bathroom at church? Nope. Did you wash your hands out? No. Didn't do any of those things. Shook a lot of hands. Nope. Didn't do any of that. Did you, you didn't volunteer? Were you in a life group? No. Did you, what was your favorite worship song? Don't have one. Which service did you go to? I don't go to a service. Why are you here? Because I asked the man on the middle cross, and he said I could. He said his blood was shed for me. I'm here because he said I could be. That is the heart of Jesus. It's never too late. And there's some of you watching online or in this room and you've never started an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Cling to this truth. It is never too late. 
no matter how dark your circumstance is, no matter how messed up things might be, Jesus is ready to take you today. All of your sin, all of your baggage, all of your mistakes, you don't have to get everything right. You don't have to get off your cross. You just have to come to him. And you can come to him because he said so. He accepts you in your ruined state. No matter what lie Satan speaks at you or over you, it does not trump the truth and the power of Jesus that was claimed for you during his death, burial, and resurrection. You have access to him. You are accepted. And if God accepts you, so does this church. And if God accepts you, so do I. You are not ruined. You are accepted. And I hope I hope you will walk in that acceptance. And so today when people around you stand up to sing, if there's some of you are going, you know what, I need, to, I need to step into that acceptance, there's gonna be somebody right over by the baptistry who wants an opportunity to talk with you and pray with you and maybe answer some of the questions you have. To the rest of you in the room, maybe you're navigating something in one of the four buckets or you're a person who loves one of the people who's navigating something in the four buckets, we have gotta be a church that loves people well. And I'm gonna encourage you to get down on your knees and say, God, how can you use me? How can you use me to speak truth into people's lives? How can you use me to be honest with other people so they can hear about my struggle and they can see how you're working in my life? Because deep down inside, I think every single one of us wants to be a part of a church where people can be honest, where people can find hope and healing but that church doesn't happen. That church doesn't take place until you and I both take our part in it. Would you guys stand with me? Heavenly Father, use this moment right now to bring serious change in every single heart and every single life. God, remove the lies of Satan. Sear into our conscience your truths. God, I know that there's gonna be a battle right now with people thinking all kinds of things in their head, some wanting to make a move and some not wanting to, some wanting to take steps closer to you and others are battling whether or not they should and God, I know which voice is yours and so do they. And God, I've prayed this prayer before. I'm just asking that right now you would win the war in their mind, that we would recognize the power of your truth and we would walk in it and that you would silence Satan, silence any voice that is keeping them from moving closer to you. In your name I pray, amen.